I want to talk today a little bit about retention. I'm a prosthodontist and in my practical courses I notice that the topic of retention is among my colleagues not always completely known, which is a very basic thing and really important to know about it if you want to produce preparations where your crowns don't fall off if, if you use conventional cements. So let's look first at some basic uh, prerequisites for all ceramic restorations. We need to stick to the minimal thicknesses that the manufacturers of these materials tested out. So that is one of the main mistakes or common mistakes that is done that we prep not thick enough uh, for the later restoration. I just saw that yesterday there's a very clever new kit or tool from Comet. You should check that out. It's some death burrs uh, with a defined uh, length. So you can put in the beginning your death marking in, uh, in, into the central fissure and then you are sure that you have a minimum reduction of 1.5 or 2 millimeters. That depends of course on the material. When I prep, I always try to make a really regular reduction around the tooth uh, in regard to the prep line. You don't orient yourself on the different uh, areas of the tooth because there are overhangs which are thicker and other areas which are more flat. So in the end, you want to have a regular cone and ideally look from above and see that your step or your bevel is really uniform. And this illustrates this that the shape of the tooth is later not really relevant anymore. This is a nice example of a really ideal preparation for an all-ceramic crown. Uh, not I did this, this comes from a university in Germany from some study and I was really happy to see that also in universities with very renowned professors they do it exactly as I do it. So I'm not just a dentist who thinks I do it right but this is uh, how it should look. It should have a pronounced bevel so your ceramic doesn't get too thin on the edges. You have a reduced anatomy, you try to keep all the planes of the occlusal surface but simplify them and reduce them and then round uh, everything. Here just a clinical example and one point in dentistry how you can improve your results and the quality of your work is try to standardize everything that you can standardize. Every case is different anyways, we have only special cases but what you can do in the same way for each patient, then try to do it the same way. A lot of dentists do it today like this, tomorrow the other way, and the next week we try something else. But then you will not progress. Uh, it's difficult enough to stick to the standards and really be consistent about what you do. Here's just some clinical pictures of a regular or ceramic crown. And now if you think compared to your gold margins, which are much thinner, 0.6 or 0.8 millimeter pronounced bevel at the margin. Isn't that too much? What's with the pulp? Isn't it dangerous to hurt uh, the, the living tooth? We did uh, several micro CT scans on extracted teeth and somehow this seems to be a law of nature almost independent from which tooth it is. If, is it a lower incisor or upper big molar? Always we have two millimeter, two substance to the pulp. What is gray in this uh, color coding is two millimeters and what is green is less than two millimeters. And you see that at the sentiment to M animal junction, um, there's always also the border between green and gray. And we looked at many teeth and it always was the same premolars, lower premolar. Um, we have two millimeters and that's important to know. You have to know how thick is that dentin you go into it. So 0 0.6, 0 0.8 millimeters won't hurt your regular vital tooth. Let's look at anterior crowns. Of course, this is just not fixed values. It's a range. There are materials you can go thinner. Other materials you need more space. Dental technicians will always tell you Palatally, they very often don't have enough space. That's a big problem for the labs. We dentists tend to not reduce sufficiently on the palatal surface. It's also difficult. It's really not easy for us to make all the reduction that we should. On this picture, it looks easy, okay? It's just a regular uh, reduction. But if you look at this three-dimensionally and reduce from a regular upper, uh, uh, upper central incisor of a standard size, make a regular uniform um, Boolean reduction, 
and see what you get. So we remove simply one millimeter thickness, like it, you saw before in the two-dimensional drawing. Then what you get in 3D is something which is not really good. You, you will not be able to make a crown on that because it's an undercut, and this is not how we should do the preparation. So you need to add your cone angle, your preparation angle, and by adding, OK, you can gain a little bit here on the margin because you don't have to make a one millimeter step. You can do a nice bevel. But in the end, by adding your cone angle, you get a very much shorter stump. Dentin actually looks like the pink area. Dentin and the natural tooth goes up really sharp. Uh, we have a uniform animal thickness, but you cannot put a crown on that. You have to round it, make the edge thick enough. By that, you get quite short. And now this is one millimeter reduction. And it already looks like a tooth. Oh, I don't want to prep really more on this, because uh, actually, it, it looks for me like a quite well prepped tooth. And now if you have a material and need 1.5 millimeters, or you have a cement gap plus a coping plus a, plus a layering, um, a tooth like the uh, dark one, without doing an endo, it's really difficult or a very, very old tooth. This is really close already to the pulp. So there's another problem. Usually you change a little bit the shape of the tooth. So in certain areas, you have to remove even more. It's not. I do a lot of veneers. And with veneers, you have to work very precisely on the tenth to the millimeter. Actually, with a crown, you also have to work very precisely to a tenth of the millimeter. Not only because the crown is so thick, you can be uh, more unprecise. So let's turn to the topic of retention. What is retention? Retention has nothing to do with any resistance or forces of removing a crown vertically in the direction of the insertion direction because you can even do parallel telescopic crowns and still place them and remove them. So here, this is more about friction or a conical uh, when it gets simply um, under pressure and, and stuck. So retention has nothing to do with how to put a crown in uh, parallel to the insertion direction. Let's first look at these cone angles and preparation angles. What is three, three degrees? What is 10 degrees, 15 degrees? This is a, a mathematical simulation, so you just get an image in your head. 15 degrees is quite conical. That is not, uh, so this is 15 degrees on both sides, 15 left, 15 right, preparation angle. Um, it's recommended for all ceramic restorations, oh, but before, let's look at cement. Conventional cements are weak. They have no strength, no tensile strength, so they will break when you pull, and they have no adhesive forces. So phosphate cement is a very weak cement. It needs retention. It needs a shape that supports uh, the fit of the crown. Glazenomer cements also have no sufficient adhesion, so you could uh, do without retention. The two conical stump will not work with glazenomer cement. So if you don't have retention or very low retention, you need to work adhesively. And that's important for you to decide if you use a adhesive cement or a self-adhesive cement, or you can use for a zirconia crown, for example, your phosphate cement. And how can you determine that? So for all ceramic crowns, usually the recommendation is three to six degrees preparation angle, left and right. The reality, unfortunately, is far away from that. So almost in most cases, dentists tend to prep too conically. Very seldom dentists prep too parallel. And um, there were several studies done on this. This is one from Munich. Jan Frederik Gutt went to a milling center. He looked at work from dentists, regular dentists. He did all these uh, analyses in different uh, um, planes. And this is a catastrophe. Uh, the, the median values are here around 20 degrees, and it goes up to 40 degrees. And um, that is really obviously difficult for dentists to do nice parallel preparations. So retention has nothing to do with the cement, with the adhesion of the cement. It has nothing to do with the roughness of the surface. It is a purely geometrical thing consisting of the geometry of your stump and the geometry of the crown, these two together. And it's determined by four factors, which is the length of the stump. And intuitively, you know this. It's the length. It's the cone angle or the parallelity. We know that a parallel stump will be more retentive than a conical one. It is 
The fit of the crown, a crown which is really loose, obviously is not so retentive than one which is a super fit and you put it on and, and it's uh, almost uh, like uh, stuck. And the fourth factor often forgotten is the width, because it's not only the length, it's the length-width ratio, which determines if you have retention or not. So these are the four factors combined determine retention or not. Now the question is, how long, how parallel, how conical? You combine these four factors, up to which point do you have retention, and at, from which point on you don't have retention? How, how can you figure that out? So, Retention is defined as the resistance of a geometry against derotating from the stump. You take the crown and try to turn it away. So when you try to derotate the crown, you get a pivot here where it contacts with the prep line, and then you rotate it, and here it's free going, and on the top at a certain point it will inhibit. There will be some blocking, and we have this not axial forces. We have axial forces only when within the prep line there is a, a vertical uh, load on the crown. When there is eccentric load on oblique surfaces or in a bridge we have uh, cantilever forces, then the crown can rotate. And then we have uh, tensile forces on those areas. So with this model simplified in a two, two dimensions, now it's clear that retention is actually the ratio of the blocking area against the lower non-blocking area. The bigger the black area is, the higher it is, the more retention uh, we can achieve. And if now, now I don't change three parameters, change only one, now you see why a long stump has retention versus a short one, or a parallel one has retention versus a conical one, or a narrow one is more retentive than a wide one. Big issue with lower molars. A molar is always wide and short, and it's not the same as a premolar. And why a better fitting crown is more retentive than a very loose uh, crown. And this is, of course, a three dimensional uh, thing that happens here, and it can be calculated mathematically. It's not trivial, the algorithms to calculate this. And um, we tested a few geometries on this, uh, regular daily uh, work we, we got from a lab, and you see they don't look really uh, too conical, these preparations, but there's very little uh, retention here. Of course, depending which cement gap is also uh, given here. So it's very easy to lose these retentive areas. And by analy analyzing these 3D shapes, I saw then things which I didn't know before, because from intuition, you, you don't get the idea. This stump actually looks quite OK. That, that one surface here on the distal, it's really long. You think you have a long stump, but you don't have any retention on that side. Also, it's really a long uh, wall there. The reason why there is no retention in that direction is that retention can happen only uh, above the prep line on the other side. Because below the prep line, of the level of the prep line, there should, uh, must be an undercut to be retentive. So retention happens always on top of the preparation. It's not, not, nothing that happens at, at the margin area. It's always, as you see also with these colors, happening on the top of the stump. And retention groove works by reducing the radius and generating a more parallel wall. And Today, I put a retention groove in every molar. It's no mistake to make a, a retention groove in every molar, uh, because the molar is low and wide, big radius. And as you see, the retention groove doesn't have to be deep. It's enough to make one or one and a half millimeters on the occlusal surface. You don't have to go lower, because retention happens on the top of, of the groove. This was before I knew this. I always thought I have to make a long retention groove. It's good you don't have to make it long because you stay away from your pulp. So these are old cases. But it's the simplest thing to say, make a retention groove in every molar crown. Then you don't have to think, oh, do I need one today or not? Also retention grooves for on the palatal side on an anterior crown. The anterior crown is in orovestibular direction triangular. You can simply derotate it by making a step on the palatal side. You give the technician enough space, plus you generate retention. 
you can test the if a crown is retentive or not when you get it from the lab. You take it on the single die on the gypsum and you try to rotate it in four directions and you see if you simply can remove it or if it gets stuck. And if you simply can remove it, you maybe might consider self-adhesive cement like Unisem or something like that and not uh, phosphate uh, cement. And for me, that is also the sole and main reason why Long bridges, especially on the lower, got in the past decemented so often when we only had conventional cements. Today, more and more people use as a standard self adhesive cements, so this issue got less. But uh, years ago, it was taught you need to make a stress breaker in these bridges. A bridge without a stress breaker cannot be done because on the distal it will decement. With a huge um, radius, so you need to prep really steep on the distal uh, surface. Sometimes with a large bridge, it's almost impossible to prep it so parallel that you get any retention. So again, make a groove in the distal tooth and try to prep it as steep as possible. And one reason why it's so difficult to prep the last tooth on the distal side steep is because you cannot put your instrument the way you need to do it. When you have in your clinic, patients who complain about some pain under a bridge and the x-ray looks good and the bridge looks good, it's, it's uh, okay. Always look very thoroughly with a strong instrument, pull it and check. If not, maybe the distal is decemented. You should check that on every regular checkup because if the patient feels something, usually that crown is debonded. And uh, if you send him away and say, I cannot see anything, he comes back in half a year and the tooth is completely dissolved and, and soft. So that uh, really is quite common. As in this case, I saw that the distal, uh, it's still in the mouth because there was, uh, I don't know if one or two premolars where it's really uh, stuck to it. But yeah, one premolar. And now you see that the distal side there was prepped much too flat uh, in regard to the insertion direction. And of course, this decements there in the back. So I could solve this case with difficulties by doing an adhesive buildup uh, with, with a flowable composite, trying to make a prep as parallel as I could do it, really trying to stay purely parallel, putting an additional retention groove. And then I didn't know it doesn't have to be long. The last tooth, we didn't make uh, uh, veneering on it. It was a full contour zirconia we chose because we want to have it as long as possible and a self-adhesive cement, and then also this works. Um, there are people who say a crown must be minimum three millimeters high. That's stupid. You can also prep a one millimeter high crown if you do it completely parallel and maybe put an endo box or in it. There is no standard rule that a crown has to be at least X millimeters. Uh, if a tooth is very short, zero degrees, and the retention groove, it still can be retentive. For this problem with the last teeth, I, I like very much these instruments from Comet. They're not too known, but it's, they're really useful. These are shorter instruments. They are shortened here at the back. So when you put them in your instrument, in your handpiece, then they, um, you don't see this area. They are shorter, and you have better access to those hard to access distal areas. So for all ceramic crowns, at least in my opinion, these are the instruments you can use. Um, you can use completely round instruments, which will give you a bevel. They are put into the, the tooth half, not fully, or instruments that are flat with a rounded edge. These instruments you can put into the tooth almost completely. As soon as you um, use these instruments and put them completely into the tooth, um, there might be a rain gutter. So, these are also the instruments we put years ago into this set. We sat together with some colleagues who are also experts and um, put together uh, this set where we believed this is for all ceramic crowns the right uh, instrument and the way I work with it. Um, but actually, you can choose your own way. Uh, but for me, this is how it simply works best, is that I start the preparation with cylindrical instruments because it's always easier to first try to make a completely parallel preparation and then add some, uh, some cone angle to that. It's much more difficult to uh, change a two flat preparation to a steep one because you can do only two things. You add some uh, material on the top or you uh, grind away more at the prep line and then you get a wide uh, step which you don't want and get close to the pulp. So, 
This instrument won't hurt the gingiva because you can put it completely into it. The last number is always a diameter for these instruments. For cylinders, it's clear. It's everywhere 1.2 millimeters. A conical instrument, this number refers to the thick part, um, where it's thickest. And then in the top, it gets thinner, 0.4 millimeters. I like to know my tools. When I know which size my tool is, then I have this also as a measurement gauge. I know if I put this instrument, what is it? 21 on the top. It's seven, uh, uh, 1.7 millimeters. If I put this into the tooth 50%, I have like 0.8 millimeters step. So it's really useful to also look at these uh, numbers here. So let's see how this looks uh, clinically. Um, of course, everybody can choose the different sequence. Some people prefer to do occlusal reduction first. Others prefer to do uh, separation first. Um, no matter how you start, there's here the separation first. I try to do a uniform cylindrical step around the tooth because with a cylinder it's very easy to really keep this at a uniform um, depth and try to do this as parallel as possible. I don't tilt my hand, I just prep in a parallel way. It's easier than doing some freehand artistry here. Then you get a rather cylindrical uh, stump can check if you are, have a uniform reduction. The small, thick instrument in this set is intended to do occlusal reduction. Again, if you know the diameter, 1.4 millimeters, you don't go and remove thin layer by thin layer like onions. You go into it, put it down completely, 1.5 millimeters occlusal reduction, and then you go from left to right and uh, see that also in the central pit uh, you are really deep enough. Do the four directions of the occlusal surface, N not simply flat, but reduce the anatomical shape of the crown, like you here see here, one uh, plane and uh, the other plane, four planes to keep the, the cusp shapes. Usually here I put my cord in, because with the fine instruments it's not such a problem to if you touch the cord, but with the rough instruments you could uh, take out your cord. These are the rough instruments with the final shape, they are useful if you do a crown removal and don't have to do that with the cylinders. So I don't use them so much. Usually I go directly to the finishing diamonds. I never prep smoother than red, red ring. Absolutely not necessary to do Arkansas stones on preparations. It, it's smooth enough to do with a red diamond. And again, I don't have to tilt my hand. I do the same movement I did before. The cone angle is built into the instrument. So I. In, and at this point also you can go a little bit deeper to the gingiva. By that the step also gets a little bit reduced again. And in the end you smooth everything with uh, flexible discs, take away the sharp edges and try to do this the same every patient you, you get. Then you get consistent results, just a clinical case, nothing special, adhesive buildup, um, then pre-preparation, cord, as I showed you, looking from above, finishing with the conical instruments and smoothing down and try to get consistency into your work. The same for the anterior tooth. Again, separation, then parallel preparation with a cylinder, uniform reduction, respecting the, the planes of the, of the tooth shape, incisor reduction, palatal reduction, that is why the, this X shape is in this expert set. And then the finishing, this is not so necessary, you can go directly to, to the finishing diamonds and you get, try to get always the same preparations. And it doesn't look like this only on the Frazaco model, I try to do this with every patient. Um, and that's actually the uh, basics of it. Respect the material thickness the manufacturer gives to you. Uh, don't prep too conical. Try always rather to be really stick to the th uh, three to six degrees. Put a retention groove in each molar. Doesn't hurt anyone, can only help. Make a nice pronounced bevel um, and smooth your preparations.